Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. So in the past, I think a couple months ago, we discussed HIV and neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. So to round out the conversation, we'll talk about HIV and anemia. And there are additional sort of hematologic manifestations that you all are aware of with regard to HIV, including coagulation, that may be a conversation at a different time. But in the interest of time, I limited this one to HIV and anemia. And so I have no conflicts. So just with a brief one-liner, I know you all see this patient quite often, a patient, a 36-year-old woman diagnosed with HIV 12 years ago on antiretroviral therapy who provides now with a six-month history of exertional dyspnea. During the last conversation we had, when we talked about neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, we briefly presented a case, and one of you, I think maybe Dr. Peltz, attributed it correctly. It was a patient who had pancytopenia secondary to parvo B, uh, parvovirus, uh, parvo B19 virus, which is an unusual presentation of pancytopenia. It is more common for a pure red cell aplasia that can cause an anemia, but it's something that we think about. In any case, this is a, a common clinical situation. A woman or man presents with exertional symptoms and you do the workup. So this patient, as many of our patients, was found to be anemic, which is uh, common among patients with uh, HIV AIDS. The degree of anemia is thought to correlate with HIV AIDS progression, and I'll show a graph that uh, highlights that. It's associated with the decreased median survival, and antiretrovirals appears to correct the anemia in part. Fortunately, we're seeing a decreased frequency of anemia in the era of wide access to antiretroviral therapy, especially the, the novel agents. And, but it, regardless of um, after the initiation of therapy, anemia remains an independent risk factor for, for mortality. So this was, uh, is a bit dated, but the relative prevalence stays approximately the same. And so this is a study that was done in 2002, so after protease inhib inhibition has been relatively well uh, accessible to patients. And this is a study of about a thousand HIV infected patients, African American patients and Caucasian patients, and you can see the prevalence of anemia was 40% nearly among HIV positive African American women and 30% in African American men, and uh, nearly half or a third as prevalent among Caucasian um, men and women respectively. This um, study, as many studies, I think one thing important to recognize is that the definition of anemia varies by study. In this study, like a few that we'll talk about, used a threshold of less than 14 as being anemic. And there's degrees of severity of the, the anemia. So again, the prevalence of anemia during um, the duration of therapy they defined uh, no anemia again as greater than sorry greater than 14 in men and greater than 12 in women was no anemia a mild anemia was greater than 8 for or e greater than or equal to 8 for both men and women and less than 8 was considered uh, severe anemia so for women then mild anemia would be between 8 and 12, 8 to 12 um, and 8 and 14 for men respectively and we can see that uh, during the, from the beginning of initiation of therapy over time, the prevalence of anemia decreases from 64% having mild anemia and a small percentage having severe anemia, dropping down to 45% with, within <coughs> 12 months. And then importantly, so what's the impact of anemia? And the impact really is one of survival. And this again is, we don't have more recent data showing the same, but it really, if you look at the, the median overall survival, is quite significantly different among men and women who have severe anemia, such that patients with severe anemia, the, uh, I mean, the, the curves obviously separate quite deliberately between normal, mild, and severe. Um, 
And so there are many reasons for anemia for patients who are HIV positive, or really the classification we use is really independent of their HIV status, but there are certain conditions that are more prevalent among patients who are HIV infected. And we talk about how to characterize anemia. There's a variety of ways to characterize the anemia. One is to look at a production issue, and so decreased red blood cell production. And there are a variety of reasons why that can happen in general and specific to patients who are HIV infected. So infiltration of the bone marrow, so that can be due to a hematologic malignancy or really another malignancy that can go into the marrow. Uh, lymphoma is the, the classic one. Or a infection that can infect, infect the bone marrow. Others include myelosuppressive medication, whether it's for, for cancer, for HIV, or another virus. There's oftentimes a decre decreased production of erythropoietin among patients who are HIV infected, and they may have a blunted response to endogenous erythropoietin. And this actually, and we'll talk about it in one of the final slides, is the rationale for using erythropoietin for patients who were anemic in the past primarily. We, we use it less commonly now. And then hypogonadism. So decreased production. There's ineffective production. This is most commonly seen in nutritional deficiencies, iron, folic acid, and B12. Iron deficiency is caused both because of poor intake or poor absorption, but also because of blood loss. And one of the, one of the common causes of blood loss in the GI tract that leads to um, iron deficiency can be KS. And we know that there are a host of data that shows that's a particularly poor prognostic indicator for, for patients with Kaposi sarcoma and, and anemia. And folic acid deficiency and B12. And then the final one is increased destruction or hemolysis. And this can be caused by hemophagocytic syndrome, DIC, TTP, G6PD deficiency, or a host of medications that can cause a red blood cell antibody-mediated hemolysis. We saw a patient recently, a young um, man, 23-year-old guy. He was not, um, he was HIV negative, but was found to have really profound hemolysis. He described his urine initially as Coca-Cola colored, as some are want to do with a, you know, profound hemolysis, and he was found to have, he was on ceftriaxone for a CNS infection, and although rare, he was found to have a, he was producing ceftriaxone-related antibodies that were attacking his red blood cells. And so after the discontinuation of the ceftriaxone, and we also gave him some IVIG to support him, his urine, as he described, turned from Coca-Cola to Mountain Dew. So that was, a, <laughs> that was very reassuring. But we know that many patients who are HIV infected, the pathogenesis doesn't fall strictly into one of those boxes. It is very multifactorial. There is a direct effect of HIV, opportunistic infections, malignancies. The primary ones are lymphoma and Kaposi sarcoma, micronutrient deficiency, and the effect of drugs. And again, the etiologies are vast, anemia of chronic disease, myelosuppressive drugs, AZT, antimicrobials, anti-chemotherapeutic agents, hypogonadism, as we mentioned, the nutritional deficiencies, HLH, myelofibrosis or myelodysplasia, malignancy, and then opportunistic infections, including parvo B19, parvovirus B19. In the era of AZT, that was one of the particular culprits for a cause of, of anemia. We don't have to go over all this list, but really most drugs that our patients are taking, whether they're antivirals, antiretrovirals, antifungals, medications uh, targeting PCP or PJP, and then all of our chemotherapeutics can cause a anemia. And so the diagnostic approach really is, is the same independent of HIV status. We first review the blood smear to rule out potentially catastrophic things, including the hemolysis and looking for both the presence of a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with the presence of 
schistocytes and a low platelet count that would make a diagnosis of, or, lead, or you'd consider the diagnosis of TTP, which is a medical emergency, as you know, and would require plasma exchange. Uh, TTP is more, it's still rare, but it's more prevalent among HIV-infected patients than uninfected patients. So the first thing we do, as, do is to review the blood smear. Then we characterize the anemia by the MCV and the reticulocyte count, and it gives us clues into the etiology of the anemia. So a low MCV, we typically would subsequently obtain iron studies in the right sort of ethnic background. We would consider also thalassemias in the right clinical context, both in terms of the acuity of the situation or the chronicity of the situation. We would think of things like thalassemia. For a high MCV, so greater than 100 and sometimes greater than 110, we look for nutritional deficiencies, folate, B12, and importantly, we look for drugs. And I'm not sure if it's the same for AZT, but one of the medications that we oftentimes use in our clinic is hydroxyurea. And we actually use the MCV to sort of assess adherence to that medication, such that if their MCV is normal or low and they're on hydroxyurea, we worry about that they're not taking their, their medication. And I suspect that it was probably used in AZT uh, adherence as well. And then if it's a normal MCV, we look at bone marrow infiltration, whether it's by HIV or a, another infection. And then again, in addition to the, reviewing the blood smear that would assess hemolysis, we look at a reticulocyte count. And typically, patients with hemolysis have a, a very high reticulocyte count, suggesting that they are trying to make up for the, the loss and destruction of red blood cells. And again, hemolysis can be autoimmune, microangiopathic, and we look for G6PD deficiency, especially in the right clinical and ethnic context. So the treatment of anemia really depends on clinical uh, symptoms and signs, and the treatment is trans really blood transfusion. There, there was a time um, in the early part of epidemic, or even you know 20 years ago or so, where we looked for other causes of anemia, and once, and then we initiated therapy with erythropoietin, and typically on a weekly basis, in conjunction with iron, we monitor the response, and then depending on how the response was, we increased it. This was primarily due to anemia secondary to AZT, and it was a FDA approval to use erythropoietin in this context for AZT induced anemia. We subsequently don't use this model anymore primarily because AZT is less commonly used and importantly there's a black box warning for uh, erythropoietin causing thrombosis and we try to avoid the use of these agents when when we can and so if a patient needs support for their anemia we typically recommend transfusion as opposed to um, factor support with the retro team. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.